Hello, welcome back. In this lecture, this is our second of four lectures on a series of lectures that focuses on Christianity during the High Middle Ages. So in the first of the four lectures, we focused on the First Crusade. In this lecture, we're going to turn to scholasticism. <clears throat> so scholasticism, historically speaking, it emerges with the rise of the universities in the 12th century. So here we have an image of the University of Salamanca, um, one of the famous universities that emerges. This one established in 1134 that emerges in the 12th century. <clears throat> so you have universities that are going to emerge throughout Europe, such as the University of Paris, which is established in 1160. And of course, you have the University of Oxford, established in 1096, it's the same year as the launching of the First Crusade, which we talked about during our last lecture. So scholasticism emerges with the, with the rise of the medieval universities. It's within the universities that you get a rise, that you get the emergence of the schoolmen who are known as the scholastics, who seek to synthesize, harmonize, and summarize large bodies of past knowledge, in particular um, theological knowledge, in particular as well um, bodies of canon or church law. By looking at the past, because there was this accumulation of theological writings in accumulation of canon laws, which occurred over the past thousand years of the history of Christianity. So with that, you can get some level of disorder, right? Some level of kind of diversity and diversion within these traditions. So the work of the scholastics was to harmonize, synthesize, and summarize these bodies of knowledge. So for example, um, in his Decretum, Gratian harmonized um, the discordant parts of past, past some bodies of writings of canon law, of church law. And he did so to such a great effect that this body of law, the Decretum, which organized the past writings on church law, which were substantial, so this, but this work did this to such success that Gratian's work was continuing to be used up in, by legal experts up until a new book of kin law was produced by the Catholic Church in 1918. Um, here we have a quote from our uh, first of two scholastic theologians, which we'll be introduced to throughout the remainder of this lecture. This is a quote from Anselm in one of his two major works, the Pearls Nagoyal. Anselm here asserts, I believe in order to understand. Now belief in this statement, it's similar to what Augustine of Hippo said, the Latin theologian of the fourth and fifth century, when he asserted faith seeks understanding fetus quarens intellectum. Like Anselm here, I believe in order to understand when both of these axioms, it's important to note that faith is the starting point. And from the starting point of faith, one could seek understanding, one could seek greater understanding through reason, through exploration, through investigation. But faith is the starting point and the returning point. In other words, there's a there's a continuity between faith and reason. And these two things, faith and reason, can be used in a collaborative, constructive way. So it's not that faith and reason stand in opposition, but they stand in a continuum towards greater understanding. <laughs> Amongst Anselm's notable teachings, we'll discuss two. We'll briefly here talk about his ontological argument. And then um, after this, we'll talk about his argument um, for the objective um, atonement of um, the, the theory of objective atonement. His, in his ontological argument, 
Anselm posited six steps that if you agree with the first and you go to the second and go to the third, eventually arrive at the conclusion that the greatest being that must exist in our minds in, in reality. The greatest being must exist in both or else they wouldn't be the greatest being. So he walks through this argument and what's called the ontological argument in his um, well-known work, The Pearls of Goyon. He starts by asserting God is that being which can no, no greater being can be conceived and that God exists as the ideal in our mind. Then the third point is, if that be the case, that which exists in our mind in, in reality, so not just in our mind, but also in reality, would be greater than that which just existed in our mind. Point four is if the greatest being only existed in our minds, we can imagine something greater which existed both in our minds and in reality, and that would be God, or that would be the greatest beings. But we cannot imagine something greater than the greatest being, as that would be a contradiction. So the greatest being must exist in our minds and in reality. So this is Anselm's famous ontological argument. It's been revised, critiqued, modified ever since it was per, first advanced um, um, in his work, the Prosegoyon. Um, whether or not one finds this argument compelling is not the point here for our purposes. What we want to underscore is Anselm is advancing an argument based on ration, rationality, based on reason. He's not appealing to the scripture. He's not appealing to divine revelation as a source of authority. He's appealing to our mind, to our reason. And this is reflective of scholasticism. This is reflective of the melding of philosophy, which is understood as the handmaiden to theology within the university of the 12th, 13th century. So theology was seen to be the queen of the sciences, but philosophy also has a role. It can come alongside theology in a constructive way as theology is handmaiden. And so that as you see that here, we have philosophical argumentation that's advanced in order to um, prove the existence of God. So Anselm was consecrated as the abbot of the monastery at Bec Hulun in Normandy, France. Under Anselm Bec, the monastery emerged as an eminent center for medieval learning. Anselm wrote two exceptional um, treatises while at Beck, the Monologion and the Prosologion, which has his, um, his argument for the existence of God, the ontological argument embedded within it. Following his time at Beck, Anselm was consecrated the Bishop of Canterbury in Kent, England. On two occasion, occasions, he was exiled from that bishopric because of the power struggle between the English king in the Roman papacy. And so Anselm was representative, obviously, of the Roman papacy. So he kind of found himself in the crosshairs um, on two occasions. Another notable work and contribution from August, uh, from Anselm comes from his work, Cur dos Homo, or Why God Became Human, published in the late 11th century. In this particular work, Anselm taught the objective theory of atonement, which still is a theory of atonement that is um, shared across a wide range of Christian traditions up to the present day. And so Anselm places his teaching within the context of a dialogue between himself and a person known as Bozo. Here below on this in the next slide is the excerpt taken from Curtis Homo from the chapter titled, How No Being Except the God-Man Can Make the Atonement by which man is saved. So the argument begins with Anselm asserting it is necessary that he who can give God anything of his own, which is more valuable than all things in the possession of God, must be greater than all else but God himself. That's Anselm's um, presupposition. Bozo responds, true. Anselm responds, therefore, none but God can make this satisfaction. The satisfaction that's being referenced here is the satisfaction for the sin of humanity. So there needs to be satisfaction. There needs to be an atonement made for the harm done to the honor of God by the shortcomings of humanity. 
but man cannot make it. Man doesn't have what it takes to make it. Only God can make it. Bozo responds, so it appears. So, and, But then he also goes on and says, but, but no one but a man ought to do this. Otherwise, man does not make the satisfaction. So the, the penalty that needs to be paid isn't a penalty that God needs to pay. It's not God who sinned, but man who sinned. Thus, man should make the satisfaction, but man's incapable of making it because only God can make it. Bozo responds, nothing seems more just. And so continues, if it be necessary, therefore, as it appears, that the heavenly kingdom be made up of men, and this cannot be affected unless the aforesaid satisfaction be made, which none but God can make, and then but and none but man ought to make. It is necessary for God, for the God man to make it. So this argument is based on this objective truth. The argument is one based on necessity, that it makes sense objectively that Jesus would have to be both God and man in order to pay the 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 pay for the price, atone for the price, sat, make a satisfactory make a satisfactory atonement for the sin of humanity. And Bozo goes on to agree. So here you have the classic ontological, the classic um, theory of objective atonement advanced by Anselm, which is still held and still taught across a wide range of churches up to the present day. Alongside Anselm, another notable scholastic philosopher and theologian is the Italian Dominican um, and doctor of the church, Thomas Aquinas. He flourished from 1225 to 1274. Of no, Aquinas makes a distinction between things that can be known by nature and things that need, can only be known by faith, which comes from, um, which is a gift of God. And so, for example, we can know that God exists through using our, our reason, which comes by our nature. However, we, we, we come to believe in some of the mystical teachings of the church, such as the incarnation of the word of God and the doctrine of the Trinity, which asserts God has always existed as one substance and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These type of church teachings are only arrived at through faith, which is a gift from God. They come through divine grace. So Aquinas thinks it's important in to um, distinguish between, between things that could be known by any of us through our natural reason and things that only arrive at through faith, which is a gift from God. One of his important teachings, which he advances throughout his writings, is his five ways or proofs of God. Four of these, four, four of these five proofs um, um, come out of the Aristotelian philosophical tradition, and the, the fourth comes out of Platonic tradition. The first three truths, our first three proofs of God, are all very similar. So they all they all kind of um, take this argument of cause and effect. Indeed, the second proof argues that each um, that there's cause and effect. Each effect has a cause. But if you go back, you know, at infinitum in time, you have to reach a point where there's a cause that has no cause. That there's the first cause. Everything is set into motion by something else. That's the first proof, the unmoved mover. Everything's set into motion by something else. But if you go back far enough in time, there's that thing which is was not is not caused to go into motion by anything else. Argument for contingency is similar. Each of us exists as beings because there was a being that existed prior to us. But if you go back far enough in time to the beginning before time, there was that which existed and doesn't rely on its existence um, for anything else. It exists because it exists, and, no, and nothing caused it to exist, nothing caused it to move. Um, the fourth argument is a very platonic argument. It's an argument from degree. So the argument runs as such. We see truth, beauty, and goodness in this world, but only by degree, and only by reference to that which is the ultimate truth, the ultimate beauty, and the ultimate Goodness. The fifth and final proof of the of the, of God that's advanced by Aquinas is known as the teleological argument. It's, the, it's this argument that if you look at the universe, it seems to be fine tuned. It seems to be um, created 
right? It seems to be, it'd be like if you saw a watch in the forest and you look at the mechanics of a watch, you wouldn't imagine that those accidentally came together to create the watch. This is by way of analogy. This is similar to what is advanced in the teleological argument. It's an argument that asserts if you look at nature and you look at the way it's come together, it seems to be fine tuned. It seems to be as if there's a cause behind an intelligence behind our experience of this ordered universe. Like, so Aquinas, like other scholastic theologians, he places philosophy, especially the philosoph philosophical writings of Aristotle, which were made accessible during the scholastic period within the classrooms of the medieval universities. He takes Aristotle and places him in conversation with the Christian tradition. Um, so for example, of note, Aquinas, Aquinas cites um, Augustine more than anyone else. After Augustine, so he cites, he cites the church father, the Latin church father Augustine more than anyone else. Outside of Augustine, the person Aquinas cites second is the Greek philosopher um, Aristotle. So here you really see um, kind of um, demonstrated the, the, the scholastics and the scholastic approach, an approach where they were not afraid, indeed, where they thought it was constructive and useful to take the best of the Greek philosophical tradition and place it in conversation with the church tradition, the church theological tradition, to continue the advancement of Christian teachings. This is a hallmark of the scholastic period. All right, so thank you so much. Good to be with you, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.